Good morning. Um, first of all, just a, a warm thank you to Vinod um, for inviting me to the seminar. Um, I will try to enlighten you on the first years of um, South Africa's nuclear development. Um, before I get to that point, um, let me just first say something about the archives in South Africa. Um, over the past two to three years specifically, we've embarked on an extensive project to get the um, documents that are still classified within the military archives, specifically in South Africa, declassified. South Africa has got a 20-year rule, same as India, um, but that doesn't mean that even the old documents pertaining to South Africa's early years of nuclear development are open. So it is a slow process, but we have been able over the past two years specifically to get a few hundred documents um, released. Um, which we are, um, with the help of the Wilson Center, um, we are uploading on the NPI IHP website. Okay, so there's a South African document collection there, which we will be updating on a continuous basis. Um, now, getting to the topic of today, um, I was specifically asked to, um, to talk about the years between Eisenhower's Atoms for Peace program and um, the going into entry of the NPT in 1970s. So let me stick to that. Of course, the South African history, um, nuclear weapons history, extends far beyond that, but that is the years where South Africa obtained the, the necessary technology for it to, um, in the 1970s, make the transition for, from a civilian program into a military program. Now, um, South Africa was one of the early recipients of the Eisenhower's Atoms for Peace program. And this was specifically by virtue of its status um, of being one of the three major sources of uranium in the world um, and an important provider to the West of uranium. This relationship started already during the Second World War when Britain approached South Africa for assistance in the search for nuclear materials for the nuclear weapons program of the Allies. And of course, South Africa with the gold mines has got large deposits of uranium, um, so we became an important supplier. Now, South Africa's contribution in the supply of uranium oxide to the West was so important um, that it was described by the U.S. Atomic Energy Corporation as one of critical importance. And this is what we could gather from the archival documents. Um, so this was the early 1950s. So during the 1950s, we see an ever-increasing relationship of nuclear collaboration between the West and South Africa through various contracts and joint activities. This provided for the purchase of uranium oxide over an extended period and, very importantly, free of safeguards. So we, we supplied uranium to specifically the UK, France and the United States without any safeguards. Um, in return for that, South Africa got extensive technical and scientific collaboration. The United States and Britain also assisted with the building of around 16 uranium processing plants in South Africa during those years. Now, by virtue of its importance to the West, South Africa was invited to join the Western powers as a founding member of the International Atomic Energy Corporation, uh, IAEA agency. Okay, it played an active role in all the activities leading up to the formation of the IAEA, and in 1959 was awarded for its efforts by um, having its representative elected as the chairman of the Board of Governments. 1957, also by virtue of the Atoms for Peace um, program, there was a formal 10-year agreement for nuclear collaboration um, in various peaceful uses of nuclear energy, and this time under necessary safeguards and controls that were signed between the United States and South Africa. And in this agreement, South Africa would receive the 20 megawatt research reactor that we call Safari One um, from the United States, along with fuel for nuclear power reactors, or contract for fuel, 25% enriched uranium for use in Safari One, and small quantities of um, highly enriched uranium and um, plutonium. It also provided for the overseas training of a core of nuclear scientists and engineers, um, many of whom would later become part of the weapons program. Now, the documents that we've been able to unearth make it very clear um, that South Africa at this point did not have um, any ambitions for a nuclear weapons capability. So I'm talking about the, the late 1950s here. At this point, um, as early as 1948, the newly elected National Party declared that the future of South Africa lay in the development of atomic power, um, in other words, um, in terms of, of atomic power stations. Um, in the mid-1950s, this was um, reiterated again by senior policymakers in Pretoria, 
um, who says that they consider the peaceful uses of atomic energy as a matter of vital and continuing national interest. Um, the Atomic Energy Board argued that South Africa had earned a significant reputation internationally due to its production and marketing of uranium oxide, but that they would probably not be able to maintain this position merely through the export of uranium um, oxide. Also, there was a sense of prestige that started to play a role here. Um, in the documents, it specifically referred to um, the AEB that pointed out that small countries like Norway was busy with its own atomic energy research program, so South Africa simply could not be left behind. Okay, so this was a bit of a, of a look for status in the world um, with, with that comment. So what followed was a vibrant uranium trade and the collaborative activities of the 1950s greatly contributed to peaking interests in South Africa in an array of fields um, related to, economic, uh, to atomic energy. And this spurred fundamental and industrial research all over South Africa. At the majority of the big universities at the CSIR, the Center for um, Science and Industrial Research, 1959, for the first time, there was a formal approval of a research and development program, which then provided for the implementation of its atomic power and research and development. And one of the early decisions flowing out of this program was to build a nuclear power station close to Cape Town. Um, we also launched a program of local enrichment of uranium, um, and then there was also an ambitious program to build our own natural uranium, um, heavy water moderated sodium cooled reactor that we called Pelenduna, okay, which is a Zulu word, okay, and it basically means it's two Zulu words. If you combine it, it means the talk is done. We are the chiefs. Okay, so. Um, also flowing out from this research and development program, the South Africa's first nu nuclear establishment um, or research and development center was built close to Pretoria. It was called Pelendaba. Pelendaba is also two Zulu words. It means we are done talking. Okay, so, and right next to Pelendaba, there was another facility that was built within a few years that was called Valendaba, which means we don't talk about this at all. Okay, and this is basically where the enrichment um, facilities were built at Valendaba. So by the early 1960s, we see that South Africa was becoming quite adept in nuclear research and technology. Um, but it's also at this point that we see a confluence of the commercial research and development activities with the involvement of a perceived national security situation through the apartheid government. Um, and this had developed since the Second World War. Um, and this situation specifically would lead to calculated political decisions and strategizing by a small group of securocrats within the apartheid leadership. And it's this small group that would be that had been dictating all nuclear policy making in South Africa since 1948, up until the time that it was decided to dismantle the project. A group of only five or six people within the South African government directed the policies that South Africa would take. Now, to go back to the situation, um, the birth of the situation was due to two ac accusations against the apartheid government within the United Nations. The first was the racial policies of the successive British and, um, mm -hmm. and then later the South African Nationalist Party. And secondly, the status of um, Southwest Africa, which was given as a mandate to, to South Africa after the First World War. Now, as to the racial policies, of course, India was the first to complain or to lodge a complaint against South Africa in the United Nations already in 1946 um, that um, Pretoria had enacted legislation that discriminated against South Africans of Indian or origin. And this would then trigger um, a lot of resolutions um, right through from the 1940s right through to the 1980s um, in the United Nations. Um, and then, of course, the Sharpe massacre of, massacre of 1960 also exacerbated the case against South Africa, and this ultimately led to the introduction of a voluntary <coughs> arms embargo against South Africa in 1963, which curiously did not contain any clause um, on nuclear collaboration with South Africa. South Africa at this point, I think, was of too much importance still to the West in terms of our supply of, of uranium. Um, so the United States blocked um, the introduction of a, of a specific clause on nuclear collaboration in that resolution. So we see by 1963, South Africa was facing an ever-increasing international condemnation, um, which was also coupled with the perceived communist infiltration of Africa. Okay, the Soviet Union had started to make inroads into Africa, supporting liberation movements and national liberation wars in Africa. 
and that of course petrified the very anti-communistic securocrats within the apartheid government. Um, okay, so 1965 then, we see that the drivers of technological advancement in nuclear development, that, that was gained through the economic exploitation of the scarce resource, is as uranium, um, combined with the international isolation of the country, pushed it into the next phase of nuclear development. <coughs> and this is now where, um, okay, an additional factor was the concern that hostile African nations may develop or require nuclear weapons. Um, and interestingly, the archival documents also tell a story of how the Department of State, the US Department of State, had the same concerns about African states um, acquiring a nuclear capability. They specifically focused on Egypt, because Egypt already um, was very vocal against South Africa in the United Nations, had a Soviet-supplied nuclear reactor, had been pursuing a nuclear weapons program since the 1954, had missiles of a 600-mile um, range, and strategic bombers which could, which could reach South Africa. So for South Africa, that was a concern at that point, and it may have triggered the strategic decision okay, to go nuclear at a later stage. Now, this is where the slow declassification of archival documents puts a spanner in the works. Um, because I have yet to uncover conclusive documents to confirm that Pretoria had decided at this point to pursue an independent nuclear capability. The signs are there, okay, but we base it on, um, on a bit of um, subjective um, analysis. Um, nonetheless, I'm going to, to mention a few. There are some documents that mention a rumor that France had offered to assist South Africa in developing an atomic bomb, um, a claim that was categorically denied in the press by Pretoria. Um, Foreign Minister Magnus Malan also wrote something interesting in his autobiography when he <coughs> said that the development of South Africans' own nuclear explosive capability dates back to the 1960s. But then he quickly adds that those investigations were aimed at how the development could be utilized for peaceful purposes. Um, and then I interviewed the former Soviet spy Dieter Gerhard, okay, who's been spying um, for the Soviet Union since the early 1960s. He was, a, he was a, a, a commodore in the South African Navy until he was arrested in 1982. Now he um, says, and he's adamant, that South Africa already started to develop an independent nuclear option in 1964. Okay, so as I said, we still have to uncover those documents. And then there are two specific comments by Atomic Energy Board members, the one that said that um, South Africa had the technical ability to develop nuclear weapons, but then quickly said, oh, but we have no plans to do so. And then there's another one that said it should be considered for prestigious purposes and to prevent aggression from the Afro-Asian nations, with the Asians specifically referring to India. <coughs> okay, so in August 1965, then, um, Hendrik Verwoerd, our Prime Minister, led South Africa into the nuclear age, when Safari One was officially inaugurated. Now, curiously, he was concerned that the African states might, may attribute some military significance to the reactor. So he told um, the African states that they, quoting, they would be welcome to come along, adding, I'm quoting again, we have a contribution to make not only to the advancement of South Africa, but also to the advancement of the rest of Africa. Any knowledge developed here, anything done here, is also at the disposal of the small nations of Africa. But in the typical manner of the apartheid government, there was a compromise. It was only if these states are prepared to live with Pretoria's policy of apartheid, okay, could they gain some of the knowledge. So as a last comment, two last comments, um, looking again at international collaboration then um, during the late 1960s, um, despite the, 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 the various comments um, by the South African officials, um, indicating the pursuit of an independent nuclear option, um, as well as a State Department memo of, of the time that South Africa had the potential to develop a prototype weapon within five years, in other words, by 1969, the United States renewed the bilateral agreement with South Africa for another 10 years. And this was in 1967. Initially, the U.S. was reluctant to renew that um, that uh, agreement because South Africa was still supplying uranium um, to the US, UK and France without safeguards. But it's because France had not signed the Limited Test Ban Treaty. So America was concerned about um, possible proliferation there. And also France was willing to supply South Africa with 20% enriched uranium for Safari 1, which the US won't have. Okay, so the compromise solution was to, um, to, to sign another agreement with South Africa. 
Lastly, the Non-Proliferation Treaty. Um, South Africa initially indicated that it would vote for the treaty's endorsement by the UN General Assembly, or, or in the UN, um, UN General Assembly. But in the end, it refrained from signing um, the NPT for the next two decades. And of course, um, by 1978, the, de the decision to develop a limited nuclear capability was taken. Okay, that is a story for another day. And of course, in 1989, the decision was taken to dismantle okay, the nuclear arsenal, making South Africa the first country to have indigenously developed a small nuclear arsenal and then voluntarily dismantling that arsenal. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you.